Hello, and welcome to Tales from the Trunk, reading the stories that didn't make it. I'm Hilary B. Disneyx. On today's episode, I'm very excited to welcome a brand new guest and friend, Steve Toast. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Uh, as I was saying before we began recording, you came highly recommended from our March of 2020 guest, Jordan Carella, and I'm very excited to have you here. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to be on. It's really nice to do these, especially at the moment where we're not getting to talk to very many people. So it's nice to, yeah, have a have a chat. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, Steve, you're here to promote your new release to Drown in Dark Water, which comes out later this month. Is that right? Yes, it comes out on April the 27th. It's my first short story collection from Undertow Publishing Publications. Um, and it's a collection of stuff I've had published over years, plus six brand new stories, which I'm really excited about. Um, three of the stories have previously three of the stories have previously been in Best Horror of the Year, Alan Datlow's annual collection. So yeah, it's uh, it's good, and um, I'm really pleased with how it's come together. The the cover art is by an artist called Stefan Koidel, who's actually Austrian, um, and it's just really really gorgeous i'm really pleased with how it's turned out so yeah fantastic well we will uh have that cover art included in the show notes dear listeners so that you can get a look at that uh i would highly recommend uh steve you're going to be reading a couple of flash stories out of this is that correct yeah i'm going to read three flash fiction stories um to start if that's okay and i'm going to start absolutely i'm going to start with ruby red and snowflake cold all right. Okay, so. The sisters had no heart of their own. They asked the flowers for advice, and the flowers took the sisters' eyes in payment, in wrapping each in skin-thin petals. To make a heart, the flowers said, consume the winter, eat it like a banquet, suspend days of snowfall in the air and let them drop against your tongue until your mouth is full of ice and pine needles. And then? The first sister asked. What then? The second sister asked. Then breathe, the flowers said, before they became too distracted, shuddering at all the sisters had seen with their now severed eyes. The firstborn sister ate all the days when spirals of cloud froze skin and metal alike. The second-born sister ate all the nights, when the stars themselves became snowflakes to be crushed into drifts by the weight of cold on the wind. And then the sisters breathed, and they breathed muscle and bullard, they breathed valve and nerve, they breathed atrium and ventricle, and as ice formed around the pulsing heart, the sisters opened their mouths. The veins tethered to the inhalations of the first-born sister, the arteries to those of the second-born. Through a winter of no nights and no days, the heart pumped all the colour from the sisters, turning them to ash, until, ruby red and snowflake cold, the heart was the only living thing left. So, that's the first Ooh, one. That's gorgeous. That's actually inspired by a piece of art by a very good friend of mine called Hazel Ang. And we've collaborated quite a bit over the years. And she had this painting with these beautiful flowers with eyeballs in the centre of them. And uh, yeah, that's where I went with it. So. Fantastic. I love that. Thank you. So the next one I'm going to read is called Mask. And every year I, I do a month of flash fiction running up to Short Story Day on the winter solstice and uh, mm -hmm. put it on my blog or my, my Facebook. And this is one of those stories. They fitted the death mask over Farmer Campbell's still-breathing face. Loose shards of bark scraped his cheeks as a carved bracket fungus was tied to his head. Pinning him down, the villagers forced his arms into the mould-stained donkey jacket. Fastened the buttons over the tattered trousers. Down his collar they rammed a hazel rod thick as a man's arm, another along the seams of the sleeves. Then... Using baling twine, they raised him into the air, the foot of a post deep in the plough furrows. 
He had scared his wife, scared his children, left marks on them the colour of December skies. Now he could scare crows, but they did not frighten like children. The seed was deep in the ground or rotten in the storms. The birds were hungry. Farmer Campbell's eyes were very easy to reach through the gaps in the mask, his flesh through the rips in the jacket. This winter the crows would not starve. Whew. So, um, oh. my my work's not very cheerful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it is it is uh, evocative. Thank you. So the last one has probably the longest title in the book. <laughs> this is called Why the Sea Tastes of Salt and Why the Moon Always Looks Toward Us. The witch of a red house fell in love with the moon. With no wings to lift her through the sky, she went to the marsh and asked the stagnant waters for advice. The drowning pools gurgled with the voices of slit throats and of the bog crushed. You must slip off your skin, lay it by the north wall of your house at the new moon. Until the full moon scrape the fat from the inside of your hide, the hair from the outside, and shake both into a candle. When the full moon rises, light the candle and your skin will become a carpet of honeysuckle and magnolia to carry you to your beloved. When the new moon came, the witch of a red house peeled off her skin, stemming her blood with salt, the agony making her choke out the names of all five dead gods. For one month she scraped fat from the inside of her own hide and hair from the outside, shaping both into a single candle. When the full moon rose and the light fell on the red house, the witch lit the candle. She stepped onto her cracked skin, hooking her feet into the eye holes and grasping the now limp scalp to steady her balance. The skin rose into the air, fissures becoming petals of honeysuckle and magnolia. Skitter-footed beetles and gnaw-toothed mites fell in mists to the garden below. The platform of flowers climbed through the clouds to orbit her beloved, the moon. And the moon saw the witch of a red house without her skin. He saw her as a thing of tendons and tissue, of muscles and marrow. He saw her as a thing of gristle and gore, and slowly he turned his vast face from her. In fury the witch of a red house tore out her ribs, turning the moon with the broken shards and pinning him to look forever at the earth. With nothing else for her on land and nothing else for her in the sky, the witch of a red house threw herself into the sea. The currents dragged her to the ocean floor, to the hidden land of scavenged whales and the pressure of one hundred fathoms. And as she fell, the salt crust in her wounds spread through the sea so all who sipped it would remember her pain. And every month the moon tries dragging the witch to him, begging her to snatch out the slivers of bone. But she is too deep, feasting in the dark on sailors whose lungs hold cold oceans of their own. Whew. Oh. Uh, if if I may borrow a bit of Yorkshire for a second from you, that was lovely. <laughs> Thank you. I, I I love writing flash because you can be quite dense with the language and you know very mm-hmm. very very evocative. So yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a, a an art to flash that I really appreciate because it gives you, you know, it, it's almost like poetry. Yeah. It, it's one of the places I started out, actually. Um, I started re- out reading my work at um, Open Mic Nights, which are mainly set up for poetry. So mm-hmm. when I first went, I would write longer pieces. I would l- write stories that were 2,000, 3,000 words. And the first uh, um, week, I would read the first half, and then a month later... I would read the second half and there would be different people there and it wouldn't work. So I started writing shorter and shorter pieces so it would fit within these sort of normally five minute um, uh, slots and I ended up writing quite a lot of flash fiction. So that's uh, that, that's where I started really. 
that's fantastic that that makes a lot of sense uh that it is you know it's sort of a different market driven force yeah yeah definitely definitely i then started writing longer stuff when i started selling more more fiction so mm mm-hmm. uh so this wouldn't be a book tour if i didn't ask you some sort of book tour e questions but it wouldn't be this show if i didn't put a little bit of a twist on them so i'm wondering if there's any thing that you absolutely loved that you just couldn't fit into this collection so in my perfect uh, in my professional background um mm-hmm. i'm an archaeologist so i i studied as an archaeologist and i worked as an archaeologist for a number of years and um a few years back i wrote a story called terminus post quem and the idea was i wanted to try and write an epistolary story using an archaeological site report to structure it mm. so it's using we we in british archaeology anyway we use context sheets to record the finds and the features and the different soil layers and i was experimenting to see if i could use this structure to tell essentially a horror story and have it unravel and unfurl throughout that uh, um, report. Mm -hmm. And I actually had it published, um, unfortunately, a a publication that's no longer going, Mad Scientist Journal. Mm. And um, it's... uh, it didn't really unfortunately fit with everything else that went into the collection, but I love it because it was so experimental and and it worked and you know it it was something that tied into my archaeology, which is something i I, I like to get in you know not necessarily writing historical fiction mm-hmm. um of the time but using the structures of the the way we work and so i I've got a story coming out in analog um I think next month as well uh, which uses. Um, dendrochronology is the inspiration for, oh, very cool. for the story so um, again just playing with those those structures but yeah unfortunately that one didn't make the cut and it didn't really work with the, the tone of the other, other work in, in To Drown in Dark Water mm-hmm. So, but it's still very dear to my heart that makes sense and it is uh, you know I've I've never released a collection myself I've never been the like editorial voice of a magazine yet or even a magazine issue Mm -hmm. but it makes sense like i've i've heard from numerous editors you know this has to this just didn't fit with what we were putting together for the issue already so it makes sense that that would also come up with a collection yeah yeah definitely and and when you're trying to get that flow of stories through and you know Mm -hmm. the the themes themes going through and and keep that fairly consistent it's yeah i think it's important to you know be able to make those decisions and choices and for sure. i've got to say michael kelly michael kelly at undertow is a fantastic editor and fantastic for helping you know guide that structure together mm-hmm. yeah i uh i'm definitely gonna look up your analog story and hopefully some way find that story from uh, Mad Scientist Journal because I I love a good I kind of think of them in my mind as day job stories uh, yeah. I've, I've got a story idea that's been kicking around in my head my my paid work is in technology and we have uh, there's there's a tradition already in technology of uh, joke RFCs these request for comment uh, documents that every mm. April 1st there will be at least one uh, joke RFC describing uh, a protocol for a uh, web server teapot or for uh, using avian carriers as a, the transport layer for network packets. And I've always been thinking about how I could write a story in the form of a uh, an RFC and sell it somewhere uh and it's you know it's one of those things that's been sort of at the back of my mind uh so i i love hearing about you know using documents from your career as an archaeologist in that same way yeah and one of the other things i'm really interested in is um 
the idea of organic servers. So there's one of the stories in the collection, which is about using um, whale falls, where whales fall through the ocean and land on the seabed, but become these amazing um, environments for life and using that essentially as an organic server. Mm -hmm. So a data server. Um, and that's one of the stories flow to see. And then I had another one, which isn't in here actually, um, which was published at free low burning eye, which was using a butterfly house as a, as a server and having oh, the data cool. stored in, in, in the butterflies and transferred via the wings. So, you know, I, I find it fascinating taking these ideas and putting them into, into new environments. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this sort of dovetails nicely with uh, one of the other questions that I feel compelled to ask, which is, what's your favorite thing that you did get to keep in this collection? Uh, I know it's hard when it's a collection to have to pick just one story, but... Mm, I mean, there's a couple of the, the stories which are previously unpublished, which I, I love. But the one I'm really pleased with is a story called Atelier. Mm -hmm. So... I, I live in Munich now, but we're from England originally. And one of the reasons we came to Munich was we came on my wife's 30th birthday because she's a huge fan of the artist Franz Marc, mm. uh, who was part of the Die Blau Reiter movement. Um, and we fell in love with the city. So this um, art movement has always been a big thing for us. And I always was it quite interested in writing a story set at that time. Um, mm -hmm. So Atelier is essentially a cosmic horror story set around the time of the first um, Blau Reiter exhibition in Munich. And oh, very cool. It's inspired by a very little known um, Kandinsky painting called Simplicity, which I saw in an exhibition here. And just there's something about it which was very unsettling and led to the story and then everything else came together. Plus, I, I, I managed to do something I was really pleased with. There's um, Thomas Mann, who's a very famous Munich-based writer, who wrote mm -hmm. Death in Venice. He wrote a story called Gladius Day, a short story, and it starts with the, the declaration, Munich Schon, and this is a, um, a bit of a slogan for the city. So I started this story with Munich Drowned, and it's in the middle, mm. of, a, in the middle of a rainstorm, um, you have this character who's at the exhibition and I wanted to also try and do that thing you sometimes get with the earlier cosmic horror uh, writers like Robert Chambers, M.R. James, where it's almost a another character who's met someone who's telling the person, the story of the person they've met. Mm -hmm. and, and so I did that. I had two female characters one who's at the exhibition meets this other artist and they go to a cafe and they sit down and she gets told this story and it was just so much fun to write I don't write historical fiction um, because mm -hmm. being an archaeologist one of the nice things about writing fiction is I don't have to use evidence right <laughs> you know I can just make it up um, that makes sense but I was able to go out to the places in the story and walk with them and the um, part of the story is set in the um, villa where Paul Clay had his atelier. So I used that mm -hmm. for inspiration and I was able to approach the city and use places that we love as inspiration for his story. So. That's awesome. Well, I'm, uh, I'm even more excited to look this book up now and, and uh, get myself a copy once it's out. Uh, Thank and you. Listeners, I encourage you as well to pre-order this from wherever you get books uh especially if like me you're into cosmic horror uh you know i i knew coming into this that you are a horror writer and i looked up a couple of your stories but i hadn't uh it hadn't clicked in my head that you are firmly in the cosmic horror space as well which is one of my first loves in fiction uh and it's really awesome to you know i i think that a lot of people's 
impression of cosmic horror kind of begins and ends with our racist uncle howard yeah i i find um a couple of years ago i read the king in yellow and the version i got was about nine stories long and the first three or four you are the king in yellow and the yellow sign and i i, I can't remember titles mm-hmm. off the top of my head and they're the ones where you know they're very solidly cosmic horror and then there's a time traveling one and then some then they change and they change because robert w chambers was a romance writer Mm-hmm. And, and and the second half of these romance stories set in Paris. But <laughs> when I was reading them, I was still set up for reading the cosmic horror, the King in Yellow, and I was still reading them with that tone in mind. So they were in some ways even more unsettling because I was looking for that element within the stories. And it uh-huh. was a, a very weird effect. But yeah, I... That's very cool. Yeah, I, I think it it was something that... I was talking to a friend about when you approach one thing expecting something and then, you know, that almost unsettles you because you sort of find it even though it's not really there. You Mm -hmm. know, But yeah, um, the other one is Algernon Blackwood, The Willows, was a huge influence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I... uh, I don't know, I love... There's something that I can't even describe about cosmic horror that just draws me in. Yeah. Uh, And it makes me really happy to see so many new and so many diverse voices in cosmic horror because, especially because it is a genre that's basically rooted in racism and xenophobia. Yeah. And I think you can reclaim that, you know, you you can definitely there's definitely a need to to reclaim that and write new stories you know um Mm -hmm. because i i I think while i i'm not a minority by any stretch of imagination my background is (laughs) when i was 16 i I was homeless and so i've Mm -hmm. i i sort of have three strands to my writing so i have my fiction um i also write for magazines i i freelance for 14 times and write for custom motorbike magazines and various other things but i also occasionally work on art projects i've got one coming up in esh um, as part of the european city of culture i'm working with an organization called les assembler um 2.2 but i did one a few years back um in my hometown which is quite a rich town in north yorkshire called harrogate Mm -hmm. about hidden homelessness because people think because it's quite a um, opulent town that there isn't any homelessness there Mm -hmm. and so you when you are homeless you're literally haunted by this identity yeah of it as a as a rich place um so i i think finding new ways to tell stories and give people their their own voices to tell these stories is incredibly important absolutely it is that's uh that's really cool um to like to be able to tell those stories and uh, to approach it with compassion. I I think we have to. I mean, I think it goes back to um, archaeology as well. So when I was studying for archaeology, I was very interested in embodiment and the idea of ableist spaces, spaces that actually actively um, prohibit people engaging with that, Mm -hmm. you know, and how, how we see that. So... You know, you, you look at flint napping mm-hmm. from the, the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, and um, when you nap flint, it releases silica dust, which can cause silicosis, which is very similar to asbestosis. Um, so people become marked out by those physical signs mm. of what you know the activities they're engaging in. Now, how that's perceived in that society, you know, you can't necessarily narrow down whether it's seen as a, you know, something that's held up or something that's disparaged or, you know, how those people are are treated. Mm -hmm. But I think those are definitely conversations, you know, we need to have. And um, for sure. Yeah, it's it was a book by it was a book by Elizabeth Teva, who's a who's a human geographer called Embodied Geographies, which was a huge influence and had a series of essays going through and then that's carried through to my writing so i i try and use all the senses a lot in my mm-hmm. writing you know 
ground ground it in the body. Yeah, uh, essentially. I mean that that really came through in the readings that you did earlier in the in the recording. Uh, you know, I I felt very much right there with you. Thank you, but I I, I think you know you have to because if you if you can evoke scent or if you can evoke um sound as well as vision you know you can make it Mm -hmm. a lot more emotive yeah for sure uh so we're coming up on time but before we go steve where can our lovely listeners find you elsewhere on the internet um so i have twitter which is steve toes um I also have a a blog, um, stevetoes.co.uk. I have Facebook. Um, I have a newsletter, which has got slightly more irregular throughout the lockdown, Makes as sense. everything has. Um, but that's uh, tinyletter.com, Steve Toes. I'm generally easy to find if you know my name. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's not many of us out there. Yeah. Um, and, I ha- and I have a Patreon as well. And my, my Patreon's fairly straightforward. It's <clears throat> just one... Um, uh, level and for five dollars a month you get a story every monday morning at nine o'clock fabulous um central european time uh, a, a flash fiction sort of similar in tone to the stuff i've been reading today and uh yeah that's something that you know really really supports me as a freelance writer you know having that regular income mm-hmm. so you know i really appreciate people who signed up to that so yeah it's it's good all right well, uh, listeners, links to all of those things will, as always, be in the show notes. And I thoroughly encourage you, if you liked what you heard today, to both sign up for Steve's Patreon for his newsletter and go and seek out his book that, once again, is To Drown in Dark Water, coming out later this month. Uh, get it wherever fine books are sold. Steve, Thank you so, so much once again for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on. It's I've really, really enjoyed it. It's a lovely way to spend a, an hour or so on a Saturday afternoon. Absolutely. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is Paper Wings by Ryan Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Twitter at trunkcast, and I tweet at hbbisniex. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember... Don't self-reject.